And uh, let me say a little bit about the format for this afternoon's discussion before introducing the speakers. So our two speakers will each give a talk. There'll then be a short break, and then there'll be a discussion following the break. Um, and our two speakers, um, let me introduce David Albert first, but let me say something about the, the format, which is that the two speakers have actually been working on issues related to the physics and metaphysics of time, and it's clear from the acknowledgments in their papers that their work has evolved in discussion with each other. So it's really fabulous to have them both presenting this afternoon and have us a chance to participate in the discussion between them that has shaped their work. So our first speaker is David Albert, who is the Frederick Woodbridge Professor of Philosophy at Columbia University. His work has been uh, important on a variety of topics in foundations of physics, so uh, in particular in foundations of quantum physics and more recently in foundations of statistical mechanics. Um, his three books have really shaped the field. The first, Quantum Mechanics and Experience, was published in 1992. Um, a second focused on foundations of statistical mechanics, time and chance. And th his most recent book, After Physics, has just appeared. Um, and so I look forward to the discussions that that book provokes. And I look forward to his talk, which will be on mechanical explanations in the direction of time. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, um, it's very nice to be here. Um, okay, let me, let me start off by saying something um, about what I'm going to mean um, for the purposes and in the context of a conversation like the one we're supposed to be having today. When I say things like mechanical or mechanical explanation, um, what I'm going to mean here by a mechanical feature of the world is just anything of or about or related to distributions of material bodies or mass densities or physical fields over some fundamental arena as opposed to say features of the structure of that arena itself which are conceived of as somehow prior to and independent of those distributions. And what I'm going to mean by a mechanical explanation of this or that feature of the world is an explanation in terms of distributions like that and of the laws that govern them. And I take it that one of the reasons that Tim and I have been invited to have a discussion about these sorts of things here is that the two of us have different intuitions um, about what features of the world are even in principle susceptible of the kind of thing I've been calling a mechanical explanation, um, and which aren't. Um, and, and a particularly conspicuous case in point, and I take it this is why the organizers chose this title, um, concerns the difference between the past and the future. Um, but um, I'll get to that in a few minutes. I want to approach it by way of something a little more general um, first, so consider, for example, the question of geometry. And let me confine myself just for the moment, just for the sake of simplicity, to a sort of pre-relativistic geometry of space as opposed to time. Think to begin with of a world that consists in its entirety of n classical particles floating around in a three-dimensional Euclidean space with Cartesian coordinates x, y, z under the influence of a Hamiltonian. And for those of you who don't know what a Hamiltonian is, all you really need to know about it is that this is a function from which we can extract the complete laws of motion um, of a set of particles like this. This is a function which contains all the information we need in order to formulate by a straightforward algorithmic procedure um, the laws of motion. So it's a way of encoding those laws of motion. Um, good. Think of a world that consists in its entirety of n classical particles floating around in a three-dimensional Euclidean space with Cartesian coordinates x, y, z under the influence of a Hamiltonian like this. Um, and imagine this is, these Hamiltonians contain two terms. This is called a kinetic energy term. This is called a potential um, energy term. I want to focus on the potential energy term. Imagine that the functions vkj, the potential energy functions, 
are structured in such a way as to accommodate the existence of things like tables and chairs and clocks and measuring rods and information processing systems and so on. Of course, um, this is almost certainly impossible. That's why classical mechanics is no good. That's why we need theories of fields and quantum theories um, and so on and so forth. But temporarily imagining otherwise isn't going to do any harm, I think, insofar as our purposes here are concerned. Um, and if we imagine that, the reason I want to imagine that is that it'll put us in a position to ask questions about how a world like this would appear to its inhabitants. And by appearances here, I don't mean mental phenomena, but I just mean the outcomes of ordinary experiments using measuring rods and clocks and, and so on and so forth. Okay. So, the specifically geometrical appearances of a world like this are obviously going to be Euclidean and three-dimensional. But why exactly? This is presumably going to have something to do with the mathematical form of the potential energy term in this Hamiltonian H. The fact, in particular, that this potential energy term here um, is a function of the three-dimensional distance, that is, people can recognize this familiar Pythagorean um, term here, the difference, the square of the difference in the x-coordinates plus the square of the difference in the y-coordinates plus the square of the difference in the z-coordinates. The fact that this vkj is a function of the distance between particle k and particle j in the background three-dimensional Euclidean space means that the interactions between those particles can be thought of as recording that distance, as making it manifest, as making it visible in the way those particles move around. The fact that the vkj are functions of the distances between pairs of particles is what makes it possible, for example, for there to be collections of such particles whose stable configurations have a characteristic length in the background three-dimensional Euclidean space and can therefore be put to work as things like measuring rods. Good. But what if the relationship between the geometry of the background space and the mathematical form of the Hamiltonian is more complicated than that? Consider, for example, a world that consists of n classical particles floating around not in a Euclidean three-dimensional um, background space, but in some arbitrarily curved three-dimensional space, a, a space with the topology of R3, say, um, um, but not with a flat geometry. Um, um, and suppose that, suppose that we equip this curved background space with some set of generalized coordinates called x, y, and z, again. And suppose that those particles happen to float around in that space under the influence of a Hamiltonian, which depends on these generalized coordinates, x, y, z, in exactly the way that the earlier one, um, this one here, depended on the Cartesian coordinates, x, y, z. Note that this superficial similarity, the fact that they have the same dependence on x, y, z, masks very profound differences. In this world, unlike in the previous one, this expression down here is emphatically not the spatial distance between particles j and k in this three-dimensional background curved space. Indeed, in worlds like this, there's in general going to be no simple and uniform expression for the distance between two particles in terms of their generalized coordinates. And Hamiltonians like this one are not going to accommodate the existence of collections of particles that have stable configurations that, um, excuse me, is not going to accommodate the existence of particles that have stable configurations that have any characteristic length in the background curved space. But note as well that a Hamiltonian like this could support the existence of collections of particles that do have stable configurations of particular characteristic delta x squared plus delta y squared plus delta z squared values. And more generally, the fact that vkj is a function of these three differences means that interactions between those particles can be seen as recording that quantity, 
as making it manifest, as making it visible in the motions of those particles. And so the three-dimensional space of the world we're considering now, notwithstanding the fact that in actuality it's curved, is apparently, or at least I don't see how to avoid the conclusion, that it's going to appear to its inhabitants, however detailed and precise and extensive their empirical investigations, to be flat. That is, it's going to look to them exactly like the previous actually flat space looked. And we might be even begin to wonder, in circumstances like these, about exactly what it's supposed to mean to say that the space in question here is actually curved. Because the actual geometry of the background now appears to play no role whatever in the production of these geometrical appearances. It's the dynamics that seems to do all the work. A Hamiltonian like this one is going to produce flat Euclidean three-dimensional appearances in a way that's entirely independent of what the actual geometry of the background three-dimensional manifold may happen to be. And as a matter of fact, it's apparently going to produce those appearances in a way that's entirely independent of whether or not that background manifold has any intrinsic geometry at all. This second example, um, people may recognize, is a sort of inverted and slightly better dressed variant of Poincaré's old parable of the finite two-dimensional Euclidean disk world, the one that contrives, by means of the effects of spatial variations in the temperature on the lengths of measuring rods, to appear to its inhabitants as an infinite Lobachevskian plane. That parable, of course, led to a famous debate between conventionalist and verificationist and scientific realist accounts of the epistemology of geometry. But the lesson I want to draw from it here is something at right angles to all that. Something in particular about physics. What this second example suggests to me is that the fundamental arena in which the world is rightly pictured as unfolding isn't a geometrical space, but merely a differentiable manifold something that is with no affine or metrical structure at all. The geometrical properties of the world are rather emergent things, things that have to do not with the structure of the arena itself, but like tables and chairs and universities, with the action of the dynamics, with the distribution of matter and fields, that is, over the fundamental arena. We can think of the set of points that make up the fundamental arena as something like the totality of opportunities for things at any particular time to be one way or another. Or you could put it this way. What we have in mind, what we mean to say when we refer to some set of points as the fundamental arena of the world is that a specification of what's physically going on at each one of those points at any particular time amounts to a complete specification of the physical situation of the world mm -hmm. at that time. And one of the things that we learn from science, one of the things that we learn in particular from the fact that the fundamental dynamical laws take the form of differential equations, is that that totality, although it's something considerably less than a geometrical space, is also something considerably more than a mere collection of points. It must apparently have the structure of a differentiable manifold. The conception of the fundamental space of the world that all of us grew up with then seems to include both the idea of a fundamental arena and the idea of a fundamental geometry. But what we've learned here suggests that these two ideas are worth prying apart from one another. The fundamental arena of the world doesn't need to be thought of as having any geometry. And what geometry the world does have turns out not to be any part of its fundamental structure, but rather a byproduct of its dynamical laws. And so, if all this turns out to generalize in the appropriate way to relativistic and quantum mechanical theories and so on and so forth, the geometrical structure of the world counts as what I was referring to above as a mechanical phenomenon of nature. There's lots more to say about this in connection with all sorts of different questions. Um, let me just briefly mention one here, because it's one that Tim and I have talked about for years um, with each other. In the example we considered above, 
the topology of the emergent geometry turns out to be the same as the topology of the fundamental arena. Both of them in particular turn out to have the topology of R3. But on the sort of picture I've been sketching out here, there's going to be nothing necessary or general or even particularly natural about that. In an n-dimensional, uh, excuse me, in an n-particle non-relativistic quantum mechanical world, for example, what I'm calling the fundamental arena, um, that is the totality of opportunities for the universal wave function at any particular time to have one value or another, forms a manifold with the, with the topology of R3n rather than R3. But the mathematical form of the Hamiltonian of a world like this will dictate, nevertheless, that the emergent geometry is going to be Euclidean and three-dimensional. And I suspect that many of the differences between quantum mechanical um, and classical kinds of physics can be traced back to this distinctive topological coming apart in the quantum mechanical case, but not in the classical one, of the fundamental arena and the emergent geometrical space. But I, that's all I want to say about that here. Um, um, if I tried to go further, it would carry us much too far afield. Let me turn to what I was supposed to be talking about, um, which is the question of time. <coughs> There's an ancient and powerful temptation, a temptation to which Tim succumbs, um, <laughs> to suppose that there must be something metaphysically fundamental, something somehow deeper than or prior to the distribution of the local properties themselves to the foliation of the world into times. But I think that temptation is at least worth trying to resist. And the modern scientific history of that resistance, the thought that is, well, there are a lot of sources of this, but here's one particularly vivid one. The thought that the very distinction between time and space itself is the, thought is, is the sort of thing that I referred to above as a mechanical phenomenon of nature goes back at least as far as the famous 1951 paper by D.C. Williams called The Myth of Passage, in which Williams confesses himself, and now I'm quoting, more than half convinced by the oddly repellent hypothesis that the peculiarity of the time dimension is thus not primitive, but wholly a result of those differences in the mere de facto run and order of the world's filling. Here's the idea. Consider a manifold, call this one the Ur arena, as opposed to the fundamental arena we were talking about before, with the topology of Rm for some number m and some coordinatization x1 through xm over which local properties, the presence of the absence, or the absence of particles, say, or the values of fields, or what have you, are distributed. It may happen that this distribution has the special mathematical feature that there is some relatively simple set of rules which relate the various sub-distributions of those properties over the various m minus one dimensional sub-manifolds. That is, it may be possible, it, it may be the case that this distribution is such that there's a certain way of cutting this arena up into, into parallel non-intersecting slices, such that there are fairly simple rules connecting the distribution of particles and fields over one of those slices to the distribution of particles and fields over others of those slices. Suppose, for example, that the dimensionality of this manifold happens to be equal to 4, and we call our coordinates w, x, y, and z, um, and that the distribution of properties over this four-dimensional Ur arena happens to obey a rule to the effect that for every value of alpha, the three-dimensional sub-manifold W equals alpha contains exactly n points which are occupied by particles, and that each one of those points is invariably occupied by a different kind of particle with different internal properties, and that the coordinates of those occupied points vary with the value of alpha in accord with differential equations that you get from a Hamiltonian like this. Um, where xi is the x-coordinate of the point occupied by the ith kind of particle, and so on and so forth. Rules like that, then, if there are such, are called dynamical laws. 
and the various submanifolds W equals alpha that those rules link together are called temporal instants. And the coordinate W, the one that indexes those submanifolds, is called time. And it should be clear that the business of talking about one or another of the coordinates x, y, z, w as the real or the actual or the underlying time coordinate in a way that's somehow supposed to be prior to and independent of the distributions of matter and fields over the Ur arena is going to be exactly as empty as here as the business of talking about the real or the actual or the underlying geometry of space turned out to be in the examples we were discussing earlier. Consider, for example, another distribution of properties over this same four-dimensional Ur arena, a distribution which is mathematically obtained from the one we were discussing before by means of what you might loosely refer to as a 90-degree clockwise rotation in the Wx plane. In the context of a distribution like that, it would be x and not w that plays the role of time. And we could even imagine two such distributions, the first of which is a distribution of particles and the second of which is a distribution of Q particles, which are related to one another by precisely the sort of 90-degree clockwise rotation in the Wx plane that I mentioned a minute ago, and which are superimposed on one another. Um, that is, which are superimposed on one and the same background fundamental four-dimensional Ur arena. In that case, I take it, the right thing to say would be that the Ur arena is inhabited simultaneously, in scare quotes, by two causally autonomous worlds, one of which consists of particles and the other of Q particles. The particles and the Q particles evolve completely independently of one another, and moreover, W is the time parameter in the particle world, and X is the time parameter in the Q particle world. There is, of course, a great deal more to the phenomenon of temporality than a mere foliation of the Ur arena into times. There are, in, particularly, in particular, worlds like ours, excuse me, there are, in particular, in worlds like ours, all sorts of incredibly important distinctions, thermodynamic distinctions, distinctions of epistemic access, distinctions of, cause, of, of causation, so on and so forth, between the past and the future. And there is the sense of passage, and there is the directedness of agency, and there is the singularity of the now, and what have you. And the business of understanding the foliation of the world into times, in terms of the distribution of local fundamental properties, is only the first and most elementary step in a much larger project aimed at understanding the phenomenon of temporality as a whole in terms like that. And I want to spend the time that I have left, how much time do I have left? Uh, okay, good. Um, I want to spend the time that I have left talking just a little bit about how that project might be pursued. Let me start off by reminding you of the basic logical structure of classical statistical mechanics. Statistical mechanics begins with a postulate to the effect that a certain very natural looking measure on the set of possible exact microconditions of any classical mechanical system is to be treated or is to be understood um, as a probability distribution over those microconditions. The measure in question here is, as a matter of fact, the simplest imaginable measure on the set of possible exact microconditions of whatever system it is one happens to be dealing with, the standard Lebesgue measure on the phase space of the possible exact positions and momenta of the Newtonian particles that make the system up. Excuse me. <coughs> um, and the thrust of all of the beautiful and ingenious arguments of Boltzmann and Gibbs and of their various followers and collaborators was to make it plausible <coughs> that for any true thermodynamical law to the effect that macro condition A evolves over such and such an interval under such and such external circumstances into macro condition B, then the overwhelming majority of the volume of the region of phase space associated with macro condition A on the above standard measure 
is taken up by microconditions which are sitting on deterministic Newtonian trajectories, which pass under the allotted circumstances at the end of the allotted interval through the region of the phase space associated with the macrocondition B. And if these arguments succeed, and if they can be extended to more up-to-date versions of the fundamental dynamics and ontology of the world, then the above-mentioned probability distribution over microconditions turns out to underwrite enormous swaths of our everyday empirical experience of the world. But there's a famous trouble with all this, and this is just the thermodynamical version of the more general problem of the direction of time which is that all of the above-mentioned arguments work just as well in reverse. That all of the above-mentioned arguments entail not only that a half-melted block of ice sitting at present in a warm room will be more melted 10 minutes from now than it is at present, but also, and this is the bad news, that it was more melted 10 minutes ago than it is now. And it seems fair to say that we're as sure as we are of anything that this latter claim is not right. And the canonical method of patching this trouble up, the canonical approach, that is, to the thermodynamical problem of the direction of time, is to supplement the dynamical equations of motion and the statistical postulate with a new and explicitly non-time reversal symmetric fundamental law of nature, a so-called past hypothesis to the effect that the universe had some particular simple, compact, symmetric, cosmologically sensible, very low entropy initial macro condition. The patched up picture, then, consists of the complete deterministic microdynamical laws and a postulate to the effect that the distribution of probabilities over all of the possible exact initial micro conditions of the world is uniform with respect to the Lebesgue measure over all those possible micro conditions of the universe which are compatible with the initial macro condition specified in this past hypothesis and that the probabilities are zero outside of that. And with that amended picture in place, the arguments of Boltzmann and Gibbs are going to make it plausible. Not only that paper will be yellower and ice cubes more melted and people more aged and smoke more dispersed toward the future, but that they were all less so, just as our experience tells us in the past. With that additional stipulation in place, to put it another way, the arguments of Boltzmann and Gibbs are going to make it plausible that the second law of thermodynamics remains in force all the way from the end of the world back to its beginning. What we have from Boltzmann and Gibbs, then, is a probability distribution over possible initial microconditions of the world, which, when combined with the exact deterministic microscopic equations of motion, apparently makes good empirical predictions about the values of the thermodynamic parameters of macroscopic systems. And it turns out, and this is the punchline, I guess, that there are reasons to hope that this same simple probability distribution over microscopic initial conditions of the universe can also offer us clear and complete and perspicuous explanations, not only of the time asymmetry of thermodynamics, but of the time asymmetry of our epistemic access to the past and future, and of the time asymmetry of intervention, that is, of the fact or, or of, of the conviction that by acting now we can affect the future but not the past, and of the sense of passing and of the uniqueness of the present, and in short, of the whole phenomenon, the whole rich phenomenon of temporality. The business of explicitly putting these explanations together is, as I said, a large undertaking and it encompasses the work now of a growing number of different investigators, and it's still very much underway, and I'm not going to be able to give you anything along the lines of an exhaustive or systematic description of that project here. But I want to point to one or two simple fundamental observations that I hope will suggest something about how such explanations might ultimately look. Consider, to begin with, the following two different procedures for making intertemporal inferences. So procedure one, start with some collection of facts, F, about the physical condition of the world at time t. 
put a probability distribution which is uniform with respect to the standard measure on phase space over all of the possible micro conditions of the world which are compatible with this set of facts F that you happen to know. Evolve that distribution forwards or backwards in time by means of the microscopic equations of motion so as to obtain information about the physical condition of the world at other times. Call this inference by prediction if the other time in question is in the future of t, and call it inference by retrodiction if the other time in question is at the, in the past of t. Okay. The entirety of what we justifiably believe about the future, I suspect, can in principle be obtained by prediction from the entirety of what we justifiably believe about the present. By ret but retrodicting from what we believe about the present is a notoriously terrible way of drawing conclusions about the past. One of the lessons of the work of Boltzmann and Gibbs, for example, is that retrodicting from what we know of the present is going to imply that the half-melted ice in the glass of water in front of me, if there were one, um, um, was more melted ten minutes ago than it is now and that I have never looked younger than I do now, which would be horrible, um, and that Napoleon never existed, and so on. Two, second method of making intertemporal inferences. Start with two collections of facts about the physical condition of the world, F1 and F2, where all the facts in F1 pertain to some particular time T1, and all the facts in F2 pertain to some other particular time T2. Put a probability distribution which is uniform with respect to the standard measure on phase space over all of the possible microscopic histories of the world, which are compatible with F1 and F2, and the microscopic equations of motion, and use that distribution to obtain information about the physical condition of the world at times between T1 and T2. Call this, so the earlier one was called inference by prediction or retrodiction, call this inference by measurement. Inference by measurement is so called because it's modeled on the logic of measuring instruments. Measuring instruments, that is, are the sorts of systems which reliably undergo some particular transition when they interact in the appropriate way with the system they're designed to measure, only in the event that the measured system is at the time of the interaction in one or another of some particular collection of physical situations. The record which emerges from a measuring process is a relation, if you consider it properly, between the conditions of the measuring device at the two opposite temporal ends of the interaction. The record-bearing conditions of measuring devices which obtain at one temporal end of such an interaction are reliable indicators of the situation of the measured system at the time of the interaction only in the event that the measuring device is in its ready condition the condition that is in which the device is calibrated and plugged in and facing in the right direction and in every other respect all set to do its job at the interaction's other temporal end. The sort of inference from one makes from a recording is not from one time to a second time in its future or past, as is the case in prediction retrodiction, but rather from two times to a third one that typically lies in between them. And note, and this is the important point to note, that inferences by measurement can be fantastically more powerful, that inferences by measurement can be fantastically more informative than inferences of the predictive, retrodictive variety. Think for an example, for example, of an isolated collection of billiard balls moving around on a frictionless table. And consider the question of whether or not over the next 10 seconds, Billiard ball number five is going to collide with any of the other billiard balls. The business of answering that question by means of prediction is plainly going to require a great deal of calculation, and that calculation is going to require as input a great deal of information about the present. It will require, in particular, a complete catalog of the present positions and velocities of every single one of the billiard balls on the table. But notice that if we happen to know, by hook or by crook, that billiard ball number five was moving ten seconds ago, 
Then the question of whether or not billiard ball number five happens to have collided with any of the other billiard balls over the past 10 seconds can be settled definitively in the affirmative without any calculation at all, merely by the single binary bit of information that billiard ball number five is currently at rest. And note that whereas the information that billiard ball number five was moving 10 seconds ago and that it is now at rest is going to suffice, uh, excuse me, and note that, that, I'm sorry, that whereas the information that ball number five was moving 10 seconds ago and that it is now at rest is going to suffice completely irrespective of how many balls there are on the table to settle the question of whether or not billiard ball number five was involved in a collision over the past 10 minutes, the amount of information we're going to require in order to, in order to determine by means of prediction whether or not billiard ball number five will be in a collision over the next 10 seconds is going to rise and rise without any limit as the number of balls on the table does. But there's an obvious puzzle about how it is that inferences by measurement, as I'm calling them, can ever actually manage to get off the ground. The game here, after all, is to look at the business of making inferences from one time to another. The game, more particularly, is to look into what we can know about the complete history of the world from the vantage point of the present. And in the context of an investigation like that, the facts that it's going to be appropriate to think of as unproblematically given to us, the facts from which it's going to be appropriate to think of these inferences as starting out, are presumably going to be limited to facts about how the world is now. Consider, for example, the case of the billiard balls. If I happen to know that billiard ball number five was moving 10 seconds ago, then indeed I need know no more of the present state of the entire collection of balls than that billiard ball number five is currently at rest in order to conclude that billiard ball number five has been involved in a collision over the past 10 seconds. But how is it that I ever do happen to know that billiard ball number five was moving 10 seconds ago? Well, presumably by measurement. Presumably that is because I have a record of it. But how is it that I know that the purported record in question is actually reliable? How is it, that is, that I know that the measuring device which, was presently, which presently bears the purported record of billiard ball number fives having been in motion 10 seconds ago was in fact in its ready condition at the appropriate time prior to 10 seconds ago? Well, presumably by means of another measurement. And before you know it, a ruinous, world-devouring regression is underway, which can only be stopped by means of something we can be in a position to assume about some other time, something of which we have no record, something which cannot be inferred from the present by means of prediction or retrodiction, something which is sufficiently relentless investigation of the ultimate grounds of our knowledge of almost anything we know about the past, that the half-melted ice cube in front of me was less melted 10 minutes ago than it is now, that I once looked younger, that Napoleon existed, etc., must eventually lead back the ultimate primordial mother, as it were, of all ready conditions. And the thought is that there's an obvious candidate for just such a primordial mother sitting right in the center of the standard statistical mechanical account of the second law of thermodynamics in the form of this past hypothesis that I mentioned earlier. The thought is that it's because the fundamental laws of physics contain a past hypothesis but no analogous future one that facts about the present can be so mind-bogglingly more informative about what's already happened than they ever are about what's to come. The thought is that there can be measurements of the past but not the future precisely because there is something in the past but nothing analogous in the future to put an end to the regress I was talking about before. And it turns out, do I have a few more minutes? Yeah, I'll take a few more. It turns out that the flip side of all this has a lesson in it about the asymmetry of intervention. Think again of the collection of billiard balls. 
And suppose, and this is what's going to stand in, in the context of this very simple toy example for a past hypothesis, suppose that ball number five was moving 10 seconds ago. What we learned about that sort of a collection of balls a few minutes ago was that whether or not ball number five will be involved in a collision over the next 10 seconds depends on more or less everything about the present condition of every single one of the balls on the table. But whether or not ball number five has been involved in a collision over the past 10 seconds can at least in some cases be settled by the present condition of ball number five all by itself. And so, very crudely, almost everything about the physical condition of the world at present can affect whether or not ball number five will be involved in a collision over the next 10 seconds, but almost nothing about the physical condition of the world at present, nothing in this particular case, save the present state of motion of ball number five itself, can affect whether or not ball number five was involved in a collision over the past 10 seconds. And so there are, as it were, a far wider variety of potentially available routes to influence over the future of the ball in question here. There are a far wider variety of what you might call causal handles on the future of the ball in question here than there are on its past. And all of this is going to generalize what I say here is fairly straightforwardly, but that's not true. Um, but it's going to generalize, if all goes well, let's say, um, to cases of worlds which are much richer and much more complicated and much more like our own. I'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs>